Good morning, folks. I'm thrilled to get us started. Um, and uh, I know folks are streaming in, bringing that last cup of coffee, or that first cup of coffee. Um, but I'm Martha Jones, and um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all who are here with us at the Lewis um, and to welcome our friends and colleagues. I don't know where the cameras are actually, so wherever our friends and colleagues are um, coming in on the Zoom, um, we're so grateful for folks um, spending the day with us today. My job is a brief one um, just to welcome you all here today. Um, some of us were together last night and had a chance um, to hear Sherilyn Eiffel, Jamel Bowie, Asma Naeem. Um, I s expect that a lot of what we heard last night will resonate through the day, um, but I'm so grateful to them for setting the table for us um, and getting the conversation started. When we started our work at Hard Histories at Hopkins, um, one of the things I never anticipated was you all who are in the room. Um, how it is that we would be connected with so many um, important projects, innovative projects, difficult projects throughout the city. Um, I think one of my takeaways um, from these last years is in some ways um, how um, in the best sense um, modest our work has been um, and that the real meaning of it has turned out to be um, how it is connected to the work you all are doing um, where you are um, in this city and beyond. Um, we get asked a lot why hard histories. Um, I could go on. I could write a whole book, and I will. <laughs> um, but of course, because um, a great deal of the subject matter, um, a great deal of the human strife, grief, degradation, and more um, is um, the everyday matter of the work we do. Um, we heard last night um, the beginning of the challenge of resistance, the ways in which our work has been um, challenged both internally and externally as we do the work. Um, I know a lot of us are struggling always finding our ethical footing um, as we confront new material, new challenges, new archives. Um, and connected to that, thinking always about accountability. To whom are we accountable in this work? Um, and I hope we'll talk about that today. Um, certainly in my work, um, I get asked, so when will you be done? When will you be finished? Now, there are lots of ways to answer that question. I don't, you know, someday I intend to put my feet up a little bit and take a break, but really um, I think that my reflection is not about when is any given project done, when is any given initiative done, but really how hard histories um, can become part of our everyday, ordinary, um, ongoing institutional practice. Um, our work has largely uh, focused um, at Hopkins on the history of slavery, um, on anti-black racism and discrimination, um, but we know that is just one part of this story. Um, there are many, many other hard histories um, to know, to excavate, to be accountable to, um, and shouldn't this kind of capacity for self-examination, self-reflection, and for change um, be um, always a part of the way we work. Um, we, at least in our, in our project, really hope that will be the case. Um, so we're really honored to have you here. I don't want to take a lot more time, um, and I know uh, I'll have um, a chance at the end of the day to say some more formal thank yous. Um, but I'm excited to think with you today about um, change um, above all else, changing missions, landscapes, narratives, and leadership. Um, and now I'm going to do a little housekeeping. Um, uh, we have a photographer with us today. 
Thank you. You heard the click. Um, but um, I want to reassure folks that these images will not um, circulate or be reproduced or published without your consent. So um, we will keep a, um, a locked archives of these images. And if there is occasion to use them, share them, circulate them, um, we will come back to you. And so um, please, I hope that allays concerns you might have about your privacy. And we want to respect that. Um, uh, perhaps a little more complex is the live stream. Um, so please be aware that this event is being live streamed and recorded and it will um, ultimately be up on our YouTube site. Um, and so um, you may tailor your participation accordingly, um, given your comfort level. Um, I want to just um, shout out to Greg in the back. Um, who is our graphic note taker today, and I hope you'll um, check in with him across the course of the day and see um, this remarkable uh, creation that uh, he's already well at work on and um, which we will use at the end of the day just to kind of facilitate um, our wrap-up. Um, I want to say one more thing. Um, There'll be lots of thanks today, but I want to say um, right up front, thank you to Lauren Feldman. Um, Dr. Feldman, you all know because Lauren has really, uh, you know, been um, the vision and the engine and more. Um, so, uh, Lauren, I can't thank you enough. And um, with that, I'm going to, excuse me. With that, if I could, I'm going to turn it over to Ron Cassie and say thank you say the batteries are going. <laughs> anyway, thank you all, and thanks so much, Ron, for being here. Uh, thanks so much, Clark. Um, it's a real honor to be here. I was at the event last night at the Baltimore Museum of Art, which was just fantastic, and honored to participate. And, and um, I saw a lot of, saw a bunch of familiar faces last night and met some new folks at the museum. And I think as Martha said, that one thing about hard history is it's brought a lot of people together in the city. Um, and again, I see some familiar faces here and um, hopefully there's some, uh, some friends online as well who are, who are checking in um, with the webinar. I'm just going to um, introduce everybody and, and, uh, and get the panel started. We're going to be talking about you know, the changing nature of um, the missions that we all work for. And uh, that uh, even includes Baltimore Magazine. Um, we're not quite uh, the oldest organization in the city, but we're about 115 years old, Baltimore Magazine. And um, along with the Walters and, uh, and the b &O Railroad Museum, which I think date back to the 40s and 50s, we have some of the oldest organizations, probably um, institutions in the city. And, uh, and with the um, uh, the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have a little bit of a new organization, so that'll be a nice, a nice balance. So I'm going to just start by introducing everybody. Um, this is Jonathan Golden, who is the chief curator at the B&O Railroad Museum. Um, he's been there since 20, 2019, and you can have a seat, Jonathan. And um, I guess we'll put um, Anna Kresmer, um, who is the head of the B&O Railroad Museum's Archival and Research Collections on stage. Thanks, Anna. And also Teresa Soto um, from the Walters Museum. I see some other folks from the Walters Museum here, which is nice. Um, Teresa is the Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Walters Museum. And she's uh, co-editor of the 2022 book, From Small Winds to Sweeping Change, Working Together to Foster Equity, Inclusion, and anti-racism anti -racism in museums, and, and that seems uh, particularly appropriate for tonight's, today, this morning's conversation, actually. Um, and finally, uh, David Falconulli is from Morgan State, and he is the chair of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is the first state-level commission in the U.S. dedicated to chronicling and bringing about justice to racial terror and lynching. Um, an organization that's been doing just amazing work and um, hosting great events as well. So welcome to everybody. Um, I've, had a, I've had a great pleasure of, of getting to know everybody just a little bit in the last couple of days, which has been great. And um, I'm sure like most people here and most people check in through the webinar, um, they've been to the Walters, they've been to the B&O Railroad, and they actually have seen some of the change that's going on 
in, in real time at those at those great institutions. And um, I've been to both the um, the reinstallation of the Asian art collection at the Walters, which is amazing, and, and also we'll talk about a little bit goes directly to the changing nature and, and uh, mission at the Walters and uh, the B&O Railroad Museum, which I stopped by uh, recently um, and checked out the new Underground Railroad exhibition, which is amazing. And, and friends have been telling me about this, mu this exhibition, um, I mean, I think all for like the past year. And so I finally got over there recently. And it's amazing work. Um, so one of, the, one of the questions that I'm always interested in as a, as a journalist is, you know, origin stories, right? Like we always have to drill down to, you know, what's the, like that early moment for people when, when either yourself personally or, or the institution that you work for made a change? Like what's, what, was that, what was that spark? And I'll, I can say at the magazines, at Baltimore Magazine, it was certainly 2015 and the killing of Freddie Gray uh, while in police custody that sparked real change at the magazine. We, we had been doing stories about um, the desegregation of schools, like um, on the 60th anniversary of that, doing like oral histories. And, um, you know, similar, similar type work around the, the Morgan State College sit-ins, um, talking to people who were involved with those. But after 2015, and, and, and we began reporting on the, uh, the demonstrations at Penn North and, and followed up the whole year, and the magazine actually ended up winning a national award for our series coverage, um, which is a little different than what newspaper coverage looks like when, when you're a magazine doing ongoing series work, um, which was great because, you know, initially there was some hesitation within the organization, you know, is, is this our story to cover kind of thing. And by 2016, the year anniversary, we did a, a, a big feature, about 12 pages in the magazine, called A Tale of Two Cities, about what West Baltimore had been like in its heyday in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, and, and, and how it became the West Baltimore that we, we saw in the news that day. And it was a real deep dive into structural racism and white flight, the highway to nowhere, redlining, um, even the segregation of the public school systems that became resegregated. And um, that was, I think, a, a turning point, too, that, that, that story for us. And I know it was on the, um, Lawrence Brown's put on the curriculum at Morgan State in the past. Um, so 2015 was really a turning point for us. And then 2020, with, with George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, we had Kadwani Fidel, who people know as a, both a Coppin State professor and a, uh, uh, one of the city's uh, you know, preeminent poets and activists. And we did a whole cover story and feature on, on the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. Um, and so that was a kind of a, I don't want to use the word like doubling down, but it was at that point, it felt like, of course, we're going to do this story. You know, that, that we had, what we'd done from 2015, five years, it was kind of like, of course, this is our story to tell and we're going to put it on the cover and this is important. So that's just to share with you as a 115-year-old organization in the city, white-led, White owned, the, you know, um, that prior to 2015 did, did not have a, a, a great history, to be honest, of, of, of having uh, black editors and photographers and contributors, um, you know, really sparked a sea change at the magazine. So I was going to start actually with, with um, asking David, since his organization is a little bit different because I feel like it was founded after 2015 in Baltimore and is, is unique in that it was not so much a, an older organization changing gears, but a new organization founded explicitly with this message, um, with this mission, excuse me, of, of, of addressing hard histories. Um, I don't know that it gets um, harder than telling the stories that, that you guys tell and investigate and examine. Um, David, do you want to talk a little bit about how, how you know, the work of the... Um, of the uh, Maryland Lynching Commission fits into the, the hard histories um, approach? Well, Ron, you just said it. Find me a harder history to talk about than racial terror lynching. Yeah, okay, cool. We're all on the same page there. So we, the commission is the result of change. So we aren't an organization. We're a state body. We were created by law. Uh, this was a law that was voted unanimously, like I told you yesterday, Ron, unanimously. So all the way from the Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, everybody in between, all your delegates and representatives and senators, yeah, they say yes to this. So if you got an issue with it, talk to them. Um, 
our charge, again, written into our, our, our bill, which is now law, been law for four years, is for us to look at the history, to chronicle it, to preserve it, and to do our best to bring justice to the legacy of racial terror lynchings. It's hard, man. <laughs> like, it's hard. It's, it's depressing. It feels discouraging at times because you just see the worst of humanity. Mm. That's what we're talking about in our own state. Uh, you can go to the website of the commission, you can go to the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, and you can see all the places in the state of Maryland where verified racial terror lynchings took place in our backyards, right? It's not always the middle of nowhere. Nah, some of them are pretty close. Towson, right? Probably the closest one to us, Towson. Um, it's a, it's personal work that we have to do because we have to navigate this history all the time. It's obviously professional work because our charge is to explore it more, is to preserve it, and then we got to talk about it. And that part can be particularly tough uh, because there's, there's no aspect of this that is pleasurable. Right. It's, it's our duty. It's our responsibility. And it's not just to, again, preserve what happened, but to make the connection with what's happening now. That part is not in the law. That's just like our thing, right? <laughs> because we know, like you said, the first and only state level commission of its kind in this country. We've been around for four years, still ain't another one, right? So we know that we're setting precedent with the way that truth, reconciliation, restorative practice, restorative justice, healing looks like in the 21st century in the United States. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. But that is what we are charged to do. I don't see my, my colleague, David Armenti, but I know he's here. You can hear my voice. Oh, there he is. Hey, David. So he understands. He, he's, in, he's in charge of, of the research committee. Am I wrong, David? The stuff is hard, right? It's not pleasurable. We, we are, again, learning not just about the actual commissions of murder, right, of group murder, but we're also exploring the systems that allowed it to happen and just how prevalent and pervasive it was and is. So we know this work will extend way beyond the commission we sunset in 2026. The work will not be over in 2026. We aim to do the best that we can in this capacity to, above all else, honor the humanity of those who were killed for no other reason than their existence. Whether they committed a crime, irrelevant. They should have had the benefit of the justice system. One that's supposed to be equal protection under the law. We know that's BS, but be that as it may. It is the outright degradation of black lives. This is not new. This did not start in 2015. This did not start in 2020. This has been around since 1619. Let's keep it real, okay? So for us, it's, it's how do we make this collection of hard history relevant? Not just to those who are most likely to deal with the hard history, and I'm talking about people of color, but everybody. This affects every single one of you. This is our collective issue, right? Whether you're on one side of the system or the other. So I don't know how much more I should say. <laughs> uh, that, no, that's, that's a great introduction to the Maryland education. And we do it because it, it's, it's about, again, elevating humanity. I, I can't think of any greater reason to do this and to explore that hard history than that because everyone deserves that humanity. Thanks, David. I, I can't stress enough that folks should really go to the, the Maryland Lynch Commission and, and, and Maryland Lynch Memorial Project website and, and check out their events and, and all the investigations, things that they've uncovered. And it is a remarkable, I hadn't really thought about it before, as the, as the first ever, there's a burden. Um, we hope, we envision other states will, will follow suit eventually, and, and, and laying that groundwork is, is super, super important. Um, we'll move over to the, the B&O Railroad uh, Museum. Um, which uh, I, I, the museum is not quite as old as, as the railroad, which is like 1832, 1827, a long, a long history in Baltimore. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you guys about the, about the, the mission of, of the b and and how it's changed. I think you've both a fairly recent 2019-ish and sometimes an outsider perspective um, to, to new organizations, to older organizations is, is really needed. Um, and I think you know, we, you know, this is me stereotyping a little bit of the, of the B&O Railroad Museum. We, I think in the past we would tend to think of visitors to the B&O Railroad Museum as 
you know, older white guys like myself from the Midwest who have this like fascination with railroads and maybe they, they collect and it's a hobby and it's families and grandkids um, and maybe less in the past as an institution um, that's ingrained into city life so much and, and, and the communities in Baltimore. And I think you guys are changing that a little bit, but, but I'll, I'll turn over to, to Jonathan and then Anna, if you can speak about the, you know, the kind of the origin story of the, of the change of the B&O Railroad that's taking place. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, it's so nice to see this like community here because I think so often we feel alone in these thoughts and trying to make change. Um, about a year before Anna and I started working there, uh, we had a new executive director in place, Chris Holland, um, which I think brought in a fresh perspective on who we were there for, what was our purpose. I think um, the museum was founded by the railroad itself, so it had this long legacy of being sort of inward looking. And meanwhile, with um, new leadership there, I think we started looking around and we were looking and seeing, hey, we have 42 acres in West Baltimore. We're, we're like the largest institution in West Baltimore physically. Um, and we're not seeing the community here. And so we started, you know, getting outside our gates, talking with people, meeting partners, and we were getting a consistent message, like this place isn't for us. We don't see ourselves here. We don't feel reflected in the history here. And then Anna and I are looking at the history like, the black experience was throughout the last 200 years of this history. And it's, you know, my personal perspective is with truth under question so much, museums are still this bastion of a social truth. Like people trust museums with truth still. And I think, um, you know, we can never tell a complete story of history. So curation becomes the choices we make and whose perspectives are being told and how we shape a sort of pluralistic view of history because it'll never be complete, it'll never all be on the walls. So, um, you know, actually Chris came in, uh, you know, whether it's in our mission statement or not, the, our vision or where our marching orders actually came from a quote that Lonnie Bunch, who started the African American History and Culture Museum of the Smithsonian, now leads the Smithsonian, he once said, um, museums aren't community centers, but they should be the center of our communities. And I think we really embrace that idea. And um, yeah, so we have been engaged in workforce development programs with relooking at our history, uh, uh, farmers markets during COVID. So all these things to sort of open our gates. Um, but I think it really took us looking at the history and transforming what's on the walls to sort of become more a part of Baltimore because people were coming from 40 different countries every year, from every state in the country, but it was really because we're, we're a very well-respected railroad museum, but we weren't really getting Baltimore. And I think now the idea is how can we tell, you know, the, the railroad started 1827. We can talk about 200 years of American history through the lens of the railroad. And the railroad has been so pervasive in our history, especially you know before computers and all that. So we can um, really talk about almost anything in American history um, through that lens. So then um, we started this work before COVID, but I think then once COVID hit, it really actually gave us an opportunity to do a ton of research um, while at home, and then um, and then during BLM and all that, it really invigorated us to really put our best foot forward, to really go there. And it shaped the way that we thought about how we're gonna create content. Because also, uh, once we realized that we had an, this Underground Railroad history, it became really important to us to one, elevate black voices, and two, have black families, black uh, Baltimoreans as our primary audience. And then it's like me and Anna. So we, we needed that community voice too. So then it, it also reshaped um, how we developed content too in partnership with the black community here in Baltimore and to find ways to elevate black voices inside the exhibit so that there's representation, there's new histories. Um, and that was our form of, uh, and then that was our form of sort of opening the door to have the Baltimore community um, 
see themselves in the history, which is very real there. So I guess I'll stop there. If you want to. Great, Anna. If, if you maybe you want to talk a little bit about your role as an archivist and, and researcher, um, you know how that has changed, maybe, or what your your impact has been at the at the railroad museum. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I I started about two weeks uh, before John at the museum, and you know I I've lived in Baltimore for for since two thousand nine. And sort of came in as an outsider, you know, experiencing, you know, the the white L and the black butterfly, and kind of going, you know, what is with the city? How is it laid out? Why is it doing this? But as you know, as a white person, I was able to sort of just go about my life and not worry about it. But when I started at the museum, and you're in this beautiful historic campus, and it's surrounded by what is considered one of the rougher neighborhoods of the city, um, you know, you have to, it, it's suddenly your day to day, it's suddenly in your face. And, you know, I think day one that sort of influenced what I, you know, wanted to do at the museum is that we have these big iron gates, we have this very uh, big demarcated border, and it, you know, it was very, very clear, like, how can we make that border more open, more welcoming, more, more free, more accessible. And, you know, as, a, as an archivist, I've, I've uh, you know, we have a collection at the museum. It's based in capitalism. It is, we have the corporate records of a very old company that ceased to be in, 19, in the 1960s, really, for all intents and purposes. Um, but it has, its roots in labor, it has its roots in technology, it has its roots in people, and it's actually, for me, it's been a real struggle because how do you take that corporate history, those board meeting minutes of, you know, those, those white men who made decisions so many, many, many years ago, and how do you tease out that information about other people and the people it affected? And one of the big things that I always wanted to do with the museum was to tell stories of people. And that's influenced, uh, you know, the research that we have done. It is the exhibits we have developed. Um, and now it is the researchers who are coming to us saying, okay, I want to know more about this African-American history with the railroad and trying to figure out, all right, how can I get that information for people from a very white capitalist corporate uh, narrative and, and record. Um, and one of the things that we did to before the uh, pandemic uh, was we started our African American railroading oral history project, uh, which we did with interns from MICA and from uh, the University of Maryland. And we uh, started trying to interview people who were African American descent who had worked for the railroad, any railroad, because the BNL went away so long ago, there's not as many people. And people who were African American who use railroads for their daily commute, for pleasure travel, for whatever. And that really, you know, kind of started me thinking, like, how are, what are these other ways that we can get that history out? Um, and, uh, you know, probably the most moving of those uh, histories was uh, told by a woman whose family had fled from the South during you know, the Jim Crow years, the sharecropper years, because her grandfather, her great-grandfather, had had an altercation with a former, you know, the white planter, and he had hit them, uh, physically punched them, and so the family had to flee uh, to make sure that there wasn't, you know, a lynching or something, and they used the railroad, and they literally smuggled their children out one by one by putting them on a freight train and sending them north, and they family settled up in Washington, D.C., and Baltimore. And, you know, so there, there is those histories out there, but we have to figure out how can we bring them in, how can we find them. Um, and that's been led by this whole changing of the mission of the museum. If we didn't have the leadership, the board, the audience telling us this is what they want to know, what they want to hear, we wouldn't have that freedom to follow these, and some of these are, are not hard, his, not as hard, you know, historically, but some of them can be heartbreaking, so, um, but it's that need 
to tell those stories, to find those resources that uh, really guides me uh, and I think guides our whole museum. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, wonderful uh, museum. I mean, it really, um, it really is worth a trip for every Baltimorean. And, and, and so, of course, is, is the Walters Art Museum. We'll go over to Teresa. And, and I think the, the mission, what I've, what I've heard from you, other people, the Walters, the changing mission actually predates um, many organizations in Baltimore. starts at, in, before the death of Freddie Gray. It starts in 2013. And maybe you can just talk about that origin story a little bit. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. First of all, I just want to thank Dr. Martha Jones for inviting me and to my colleagues um, for being here. Gina Borromeo is the Senior Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs, and Julia Marchieri Alexander, our Director of the Museum, is here. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to start also by saying that I started at the Walters in 2021, but really 22 is when I really started on the ground and running. Um, and I say that because I have a lot of deep memories at the Walters despite my relative newness. The Walters was the very first museum that I recall going to as a young person. And I remember feeling both very curious about what, what it was that I was seeing, but also very confused. Um, I was not somebody that grew up going to art museums. My parents had um, immigrated to the Philippines and didn't have time to take me to our museums. My dad worked the night shift at the postal office downtown Baltimore. Um, and he and my mom, although they fostered a love of learning, they didn't have the time to go, right? So when I went to the Walters Art Museum, I felt very out of place. Um, and I think that is the case for a lot of young people, people of color who go to these cultural institutions um, and do not see themselves in the staff, do not see themselves on the walls, do not see themselves feeling comfortable in spaces that are grand and vast and spectacular like the Walters was and is. Um, and so um, fast forward, I had since then lived on the West Coast for, for close to 18 years and have come back to Baltimore um, with new eyes, with a fresh perspective, with a love of the city and the institution and a, a heavy dose of critique. Um, and so what, I, what drew me to the Walters as a museum professional is the work that had been already happening at the Walters, thanks to um, Julia and many others at the institution, that were really invested in the work of um, understanding the founders. William and Henry Walters, um, and understanding them as collectors. So in 2013, as you mentioned, um, there was an exhibition that uh, we ha hosted at the Walters that was about highlighting the connection as collectors and the institution, something that museums hadn't really been doing um, up until that time. It really was, we didn't really talk too much about our, let's be honest, white Eurocentric founders of our institutions. Um, and so then 2013, when we sort of put a, put a spotlight on the fact that they were collectors and we our connection to our founders um, was the beginning of that work. And so as we continue to do research about who they are, um, what are their business connections, how did they gain their wealth, um, we uncovered quite a lot about their connections to the Confederacy. Um, and so William and Henry Walters, both um, Confederate sympathizers, uh, have businesses that are based in Southern economies that are um, reliant on enslaved labor. And so that work was something that um, the Walters had made transparent, um, the histories of the Walters, that hard history, and knowing that you can be a collector of beautiful things um, and create an incredibly spectacular museum and also have a very problematic history. And those two truths, um, many of, many more than two truths, but those, those particular two truths can coexist um, and should in an art museum. Um, so uh, that work um, of, of be, making that history transparent is something that, the, that pre predates me. And what I'm very much interested in and I'm sort of riding the coattails of is, is how are we making it more public? How are we, incorporating um, this history in different ways and how are we broadening the stories we tell 
writ large. Um, so my work as a director of learning and community engagement at the Walters is to both um, have platforms like this. We have a program called Depths of History at the Walters, um, an annual program where we tackle these questions of institutional critique, both in museums and in cultural institutions broadly. And we do that for little ones too. We have a new program called Living History where we're thinking about not just the history that you learn in textbooks, the histories that you can learn through art um, and how that history changes with new research, um, how we can flip the script and flip the narrative of dominant histories by looking at, um, looking at the ways that colonialism has impacted our histories through art. We're doing that with school children with Living History out of that program. We just launched that. Um, as a pilot program last spring, and they'll be starting that in the fall in earnest. Um, and we do that through expanding the stories that we tell in our institution. So not just telling the past, um, however complicated it is, but how are we grounding it and how are we connecting it to our present? And you mentioned, um, thank you for mentioning the reinstallation of our, our Asian and Islamic collections. We uh, opened that this past spring. And one of my great projects that I'm very proud of is incorporating community voices into that space so that the histories we tell are not just through the lens of art historians, be that as um, grounded in the work that art museums are and the, the interesting facts that can be brought out through that. How might a object connect to the personal and lived experience of our Baltimore community? What might the T uh, house right around the street from the Walters Couples Tea. What can they say about the Asian tea traditions um, in our galleries? And so we did work with the owners of Couples Tea, a lovely couple that um, we highlight in the exhibition. They wrote a label about how their tea house in Baltimore um, fosters community that and the, how that experience and for them dates back millennia um, and is grounded in Asian traditions. So that work spans across um, our Across Asia installation by bringing community voices in different ways. I, I love the way the, the Walters brought in the community voices, the, the Baltimore Black Muslim voices and the Asian voices into this, like seamlessly into this reinstallation of the Asian and Islamic um, art collection. I, I've said this to a few people. The first time I went over there to see the new installation was a little bit late in the afternoon. I had one of those experiences maybe other people had at a museum. I, one of the guards had to come up to me and let me know that the museum was closing and that I was welcome to come back the next day when they opened um, you know, at 11 a.m. And uh, I actually did come back at 11 a.m. the next day. Like That's how enthralled I was with the whole experience. And, and that's like, probably the first time I really ever it was like, I'll be back. Uh, really, really great. And I love the fact you just call out Couples Tea and, and one of those local stories. And I want to ask everybody, um, about some of the challenges and obstacles you faced in doing this work. And, and um, I can talk about that a little bit as well, but I would love to hear from Anna and Jonathan and, and David, just one brief story, like the couple's tea story that, that you guys have, you know, sometimes I think of us as narrative archaeologists, you know, you, you pull that, that stone out of the river and, and, and you show it to people and it, it tells, such a, t tells such a story. Um, is there a small or, or a large story that the museum is telling one of the recent exhibitions. <laughs> they weren't prepared for this question. Sorry. We had to confer. <laughs> I guess I'll go first. So I'll say her name out loud because I think she'd be the first one to tell you she said this. Um, Paula Phillips, who was a MICA instructor, um, one day we were working with her through the AmeriCorps program at, at Micah, and she literally walked up to me and the director, our director Chris, and said, uh, "You know, black people don't feel welcome in your museum." And this mm -hmm. was at the very beginning of the process. And while we had been thinking this, and while we had sort of, you know, people were saying it less direct, maybe it was the first time like we were really confronted with that statement. And I can't tell you how important it was that she said that out loud, not in a judgmental way, but in actually a really constructive way, because we were listening. And um, flash forward, she became a part of our um, community advisory group to help explore um, black history at our museum. And now is like this huge advocate for us and is, would be the first one to tell you um, that 
it's genuine that we're really, we are trying to hear those critiques and, and work it out and work out the kinks so that that is not the case. And so I think that was a really big wake up call. Um, so in terms of challenges, I, you know, I think the primary challenge we had with exploring this new history, um, at least for us, was the skepticism both from the local community. Could we do this in an authentic and genuine way? that didn't feel like um, tokenism, thank you, um, while also not alienating our core audience of the stereotypical rail fan and still provide that experience, right, in a way that both audiences could actually come in, appreciate the history, and learn something and not be scared of this sort of newness, right? So, yeah, that's an anecdote. I, I don't think I have a lot to add, but but that, you know, that issue of trust, of believing that we could uh, make this this history a part of what we did at the BNO, um, and keep our audience, expand our audience, uh, engage our audience. I think that that was, you know, that that's been the biggest challenge and. You know, I, I remember that day very clearly when Paula said to us, you know, uh, well, our, our executive director had basically said, oh, hi, you know, we were doing the introductions and, and it was, you know, oh, have you been to our museum? And she went, oh, well, you know, I went many years ago, but, but you know, my story's not there. I didn't see any reason to go back. And I remember all of us just having this moment of like shock, like, what do you say after that? <laughs> you know, like, like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Like, like, what do you say? Um, and, and that really, we all left that meeting going, oh boy, we got a lot of work we got to do. Um, but it, we definitely also had pushback from some of our long-term uh, volunteers, our, our big, you know, rail fans uh, who, you know, remember the days of the railroad and, and they wanted to know about the technical stuff. They wanted to know about the technology. Uh, and when we started doing these more people-centered uh, narratives and bringing in this history and acknowledging it and identifying it and examining it in a different way, there was a lot of like, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? What are, they're messing with our museum. Um, and, and so we had to really get past that um, and, and kind of go, no, no, we're, we're, we're going to do this. It's going to work. It's going to work. And I think we've been very gratified to find that a lot of people have come along with us and stuck with us and have have kind of gone, oh, okay, this could work. So um, that, that I think that's been our biggest challenges. Just really quickly to close out, I think just, I think the fear on all ends, including probably our own, was it, it was that leap of faith into the unknown and, and not knowing what it would look like in the end. But I think once we've started doing it, we have tangible examples of it. I think a lot of that fear has gone away on all sides. and. So I guess the idea is like, once you push through that, once you know you're on the right path or what the path you wanna go on, I think once people see it, then, then it's less scary and, and it's been accepted on all sides, I think. And, and, and what, just the last bit, the, the, the next thing is, we don't want to stop. We don't want to go, okay, that was great, this was, this was hard, it's done. We have to keep figuring out how can we reimagine our museum how can we take that next exhibit and bring in these voices? And how can we engage with that community? Because the work is never done. So I think that's our other big challenge is don't stop. Just keep going. And, and you will encounter another barrier at some point, but just keep pushing. In my experience, certainly the narrative stories at the museum, you know, add another dimension, add, you know, to a layer to, to the visitor experience, right? You learn not just the technology, you get to see the old locomotives and the engines and everything and learn all that, that, that history, but you get to see, um, you know, the human beings who built this railroad and their stories. And, and David, I want to ask you about, um, you know, if there's a, you know, a story from your difficult work, as, as you mentioned, that you've been, you, you're, you're particularly wanted to get out to Baltimoreans, to Marylanders that you guys have uh, uncovered and investigated. And, um, and then also, I'll, I'll just give you the follow-up question. I want to ask you about the challenges and obstacles and, and those kinds of things that, that, that you've, you've faced in doing uh, as, you know, as chair of the Maryland Lynching Commission pro Project. And I think we talked a little bit about um, 
you know, even though the state legislature voted unanimously to enact this and has, has supported year after year, the funding necessarily from our last governor wasn't really always there. And there may be a, uh, a hope that may, that may change. We can only hope, right? Uh, so the challenges of the commission are on different levels, very practical. We've had no financial support, well, a little bit now, from the state of Maryland. The majority of our funding has come from the federal government, believe it or not, from the Department of Justice, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, under the previous administration. We generally thought it was spam email when we got it. <laughs> it was like, no friggin' way. <laughs> but it was true. Um, I, I will say that under the previous uh, governor's administration, we were created, we were extended, and essentially left alone. Like, they didn't bother us, we didn't bother them, we just kind of knew the deal. Um, from a higher level standpoint, we recognize that the amount of history that we can uh, chronicle, capture, preserve, uplift is relatively limited. The history confirmed of confirmed racial terror lynchings is from 1854 to 1933. We know that there are lynchings that happened before that. We know that there are lynchings that happened after that. The extent to which we can uncover materials, many of which were preserved through uh, black newspapers uh, like the Afro, relatively limited. We know that a lot of the history is oral, was passed down to generations. Not every descendant of racial terror lynching victims wants to tell this story because it's hard and it's been generational trauma that they've carried. So we have to acknowledge that sometimes there's just gonna be a roadblock that we can't get past and we have to respect the descendants' decision to be a part of this process. They, we, they not, we have to ask them, you know, uh, and we're okay with that. I think above all else, it is about reaffirming and affirming the humanity of those who were killed through racial terror lynching, uh, through racial terror lynchings. So aside from challenges, I, I will uplift the moments that have confirmed the work that we've done. So I think in particular, the hearing sessions that we did down in the Lower Eastern Shore. Let me put it this way. If you want the closest thing to the Deep South in Maryland, go to the Lower Eastern Shore. That's our Deep South. Uh, a lot of the systems that allow for racial terror lynchings to happen back then are still there now, down to the same families still being in those areas. So you can understand that there is history that they don't want us to find out, right? Uh, and we've, we've uncovered that. I will say specifically the city of Salisbury has caused challenges uh, for the commission and for some of our commissioners, and we are working through that right now. But nevertheless, we understand that the voices, particularly of black residents in those parts of the state, have been particularly suppressed. So to create spaces and platforms, one in Wacomico County, one in Somerset County, where the descendants of racial terror lynching victims had the platform to tell their truth, whatever they wanted to say. And in many cases, it was about affirming the humanity of the ancestor and also talking about the prevailing damage that racial terror lynchings and the overall systems of oppression that they have to deal with are still ongoing. Cool. Speak your truth. That's the whole point. Um, and it's captured, it's on YouTube, it's for the whole world to see and for the whole world to digest. Uh, the other challenge is, again, the history that we're uncovering and exploring is very, very difficult. Um, I joined the commission as a representative of the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum. I was fortunate that I grew up in a museum that talked about lynching way before anybody else. I got introduced to racial terror lynchings at 14 years old. So I navigated my trauma very, very early, and I guess in a way it prepared me to lead this commission, which I only did because I raised my hand and nobody else did. <laughs> Who you, baby? <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, it is about making this history that feels so far away relevant to today. This is not gonna be a shock to anybody in this room. Do you know what happened in 2020 that brought our work back to the forefront? Yeah, exactly. I don't even have to say his name, but I will to honor his humanity, George Floyd. When that happened, that became a reference point. So when we wanted to convey, you know, convey and convince people that racial terror lynching still happened, <laughs> right? That's what it looks like. Um, it may not look like with a rope. It may not look like uh, with fire, with mutilation, but the deliberate nature of taking a human life for no other reason than their existence and finding some BS reason as justification to do so. That's a lynching. The display, right? The audience, the deliberate nature of it. That's what we're talking about. So our argument and premise is if that pissed you off, 
if you saw that as inhumane, if you saw that as an affront to humanity, let us explain to you why this is the continuation, mm -hmm. right? The evolution of a system that has been in place for hundreds of years. And again, if that upsets you, let's do something about it because there's something within our capability that we can do. That's another challenge. Making sure the work in the commission doesn't just end up in a report. I read all the time. It's my job, okay? But this is way too important to just show up in something that people have to read, as long as it would be, because it'd be a long report. <laughs> what are the actions that we have to take? And that's where museums come in. So I'm so glad that I'm hearing these museums that I also felt out of place, hardly go to the Walters unless I was performing there, only went to the B&O Railroad Museum because they got trains, and I happen to like trains. <laughs> but my story, right, my story was not there. What other reason would I have to go other than just liking trains or liking, ooh, pretty art, no context behind it, no relevance to my story. So we have to do our job of, again, conveying the relevance in a way that can be digestible, particularly for young people. I'm not trying to give up on us adults, but like Whitney Houston said, children of the future, right? So let's, let's focus on them. And for them to see, again, the context of what they're experiencing in today's time, and more importantly, what they can do about it, because that's the part that seems to be left out a lot. What can you do to combat these systems of oppression? What can you do to combat these instances of dehumanization and marginalization that may not be as carnal, and I say that word very intentionally, as a racial terror lynching, but are just as devastating? Health disparities, I'm going into my, my, my wheelhouse, public health, right? Yeah, lynchings are, are terrible, no doubt, but uh, disparities in diabetes, disparities in hypertension, disparities in cancer, uh, disparities in educational attainment, disparities in income and wealth. Yeah, that's killing a lot more people of color than lynchings ever could. So let's focus on the history, the connection, the present, and what we say is not a black issue. This is an everybody issue, right? Okay, what we, powerful people, <laughs> can do about it. Thanks so much, David. Um... I did want to just add, like, as a as a journal, one thing that you know struck me um, was this, you know, a, kind of an asking of permission to tell people's stories, right? And, and being upfront with people and being transparent, like, especially as a, as a journalist, um, unless you're an elected official, I don't feel like anybody has an obligation to share their story, and I, I always want to be really upfront with the, the story I'm, that's in my mind, the questions I'm going to ask. And I, I tell people I'm going to follow up, you know, and, and um, uh, be really transparent with people about what, what the story is and, and really run it by people and, and ask their permission. And, and um, I think that's really important. And you bring it up, you, you mentioned this um, with the descendants, and, and it can be, this is part of the, the hard part of, of telling hard histories, I think, is, is making sure you're respecting those people first and foremost, above all else. And if the story falls through for me, it falls through for me. Or if we tell it later, we tell it later. Um, really important. Um, and I also wanted to know that David works with some smaller groups in the city, like Womb War Productions, and that the Beano Railroad Museum and, and uh, the Walters and, and BMA where we were last night are not the only institutions doing this work, right? Like it, there's, a, there's many, many institutions doing this work. Many were founded and launched. A lot of conversations began after, after 2015, especially, you know, in Baltimore. So I, wanted to, I wanted to ask Teresa, you know, as, at the magazine, right, I have an editor-in-chief, there's a president, and, and there's a publisher, and there's an advertising and sales department, and we've got newsstand sales to worry about with our cover and things like that. And I'm really fortunate, I just want to say, I'm really fortunate to work with people all the way up who are really have given the space and, and probably the opportunity and, and, and trust the editorial team to tell the stories that are most urgent, most important, um, even as we keep these other, other things in mind at the same time. I wanted to ask, you know, the Walters with the with board of directors and, um, and a, as an institution and, and leadership, you know, all the way up, what, it's, what the challenges are, or you know, roadblock obstacles. I don't know if those are too strong words, but what certainly there are challenges um, have been like at an institution like the, the Walters in the last you know since 2013, or or just since you've been there and, and turning this this corner. Thank you for that question. Um, as I mentioned, I was drawn to the Walters because of the work that was already happening. Um, one of the specific documents that I was incredibly impressed by was our diversity equity 
accessibility and inclusion goals. Um, and that was a very rigorous document that was um, showing the ways in which the institution at every single level is going to think about how to um, how to change, you know, how are we gonna really be a force for transformation in the community? Mm -hmm. How can mm -hmm. we be a better community partner? And what are the specific, concrete, tactical ways that we would do that? Um, and at every level, all departments, from investments mm -hmm. to um, diversity of board to um, programs to um, thinking about how we tell our stories in our galleries, all of that is in that document. Um, and so, for me, um, the challenge has been more about time um, and how that impacts public perception um, or how it doesn't impact at all, right? So, you know, when you're thinking about the founders of a collection who uh, bequeathed their, their collection 22,000 works, um, these are two individuals that, like many wealthy business owners, have a very Eurocentric, mindset. Um, so they collected a lot of European art, they collected American art, they collected some Asian art too, um, so to be fair. Um, but that still doesn't tell, as you can see, many, many gaps in history, right? So how long does it take to, um, to diversify the kinds of stories we can tell with 22,000 works? Now we're up to 36,000 or something like that. Um, yeah, so um, so we are able to tell more stories. We're able to tell more diverse stories, but that has taken a lot of time. Um, and and we have done a lot of work around programs um, that feature and highlight BIPOC talent, local talent in Baltimore. Um, and yet, there's still a lot of um, questions that I've gotten coming to the museum fairly recently, like oh yeah, I've been to the Walters when I was a kid and I haven't caught, you know, it was great. I was like, oh, well, what, have you come back? And the answer is no. Um, so for me, that tells me, uh, that that is a moment for me to ask, well, why haven't you come back? Um, and also there is a perception that nothing has changed in that time period. Um, so if, if, like me, going to the Walters Art Museum as a young person and feeling, okay, it's cool, it's, it's interesting, I'm curious, and also feeling disconnected and not knowing how to navigate that change. Um, I can see why you may not wanna come back to the Walters um, many years later until you're maybe invited to perform there. Um, so we have been making some changes, but I don't think we have um, seen the results of that in the public mind's eye. I want to follow up with you with a, with a question, Teresa, and, and um, just to give everybody a heads up, it's, uh, we have about about 10 minutes or so, we'll go to a Q&A, take questions from online and from folks here. Um, just real briefly, like, you know, as a, as, as, you know, what, what your next step is, you know, individually, and if like for the Walters and moving this work forward, you know, at the, at the magazine, for example, you know, it's my job, I don't just, I'm not just an editor, I also write a lot of the stories for the magazine, and it's always, you know, um, I always need to be pushing out of my comfort zone, my familiarity, go, you know, breaking out of my own silos. And literally for me, it's often just geographically going to different parts in the city physically and meeting new people. And, and um, you know, it was really important and, and always trying to cultivate new writers and new photographers and new designers and new um, collage artists for our magazine to bring p new people into the fold. That is a perpetual job for me. Um, and so what is the work you think for you personally and at the museum to move, take, the, the, take this mission a, a next step further? So as much as I have a lot of deep roots in the city, I cannot say that I know Baltimore well enough today to do my job well enough as a director of learning and community engagement. So my personal goals are to just meet as many people as possible. I think for the first year and a half or so of working at the Walters, I was really focused on the getting the house in order, right? Hiring new staff. I, when I started, I had a, a team of one. Um, and now we have a, about a dozen folks in the learning and community engagement department. And so now that the house is a little bit more in order, like let's go out and invite people in, let's go to their houses. And so I'm on a, I'm on a tour of um, listening and talking and learning about Baltimore today. So that's my personal, personal goals. 
Great. And I'm going to ask you guys the same question, just a heads up. Anna or Jonathan, want to, want to start with what you're, what indiv as an individual working in this space, like what you, what you, what your next step is, and then a little bit about maybe what the next step is for the museum and continuing this mission. Uh, well, well, from my, my standpoint in the archives, um, you know, I, I have this journey to continue figuring out where those records might exist already uh, within our corporate history. Um, to be able to, you know, to be able to take all these researchers, all this new attention our museum has gotten recently, and figure out how to help answer the questions people have. Uh, and, and that's not just helping them learn, it's my own learning journey, uh, because I really didn't know a lot about this before. The other big uh, thing that I think we're going to be trying to continue is, uh, John will probably talk about updating exhibits and things, uh, but we still have so much research to do. You know, we found eight people who we could confirm used the BNO in some way and, most, and uh, went through our campus uh, on their journey to freedom during, you know, before the Civil War. But we know that that is tip of the iceberg. We know that there's millions, there's hundreds and thousands of stories out there. And so many of them probably did use the railroad, the physical railroad, and probably the BNO as part of that. We did a lot of our initial research during COVID when things were closed, so it was mostly what we could easily find online. But there's a challenge of now that things are open, we need to start digging deeper and going places and finding other collections that that uh, that reflect that and and support that and then show those those experiences. So. I, I, I like this. It's very tangible work. Meet as many people as I can in Baltimore. Dig through the archives. Like it's very, like almost physical work that you're talking about. Um, and Jonathan. Yeah, I, I was struck today with the thought that like I think there's this ecosystem of truth telling where we need the archives and repository of truth. Then we need the communication channels, which a museum is a big part of. And then there's that sort of call to action, or what do you do with it in your own personal life afterwards? And that's sort of aspirational to get there. Um, I think we're firmly in a place of building that repository and figuring out how to communicate it. We, we have 200 years of American history to tell. We started with the Underground Railroad and slavery right at the beginning of our story. And so we still have another 200 years to flesh out. Right. And so, for instance, we're gonna be, we have a Jim Crow segregated car. So that's an, a n next step we're taking. So, We've already done an incredible amount of learning on a personal, I mean, me personally. I, I had never read slave narratives before, and that, you know, just dig, physically digging into the research is, ch transforms the way you think about it, and we're hoping to convey that on the walls. But I have so much learning to do about so much more of history, and then how do we reflect that on the walls? Great. Thanks, Dave, uh, Jonathan. And David, um, briefly before we go to the, the Q&A, um, What's the next step for the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Um, I, I know there's an event coming up in October, but what is the next step f for um, for you guys? Yeah, so shout out to the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. So that's what's coming uh, to Regiment of Lewis next month. And that's always an opportunity for the commission to provide updates on its work. And really those next steps are to continue to do the research. So shout out David again for, for leading that effort. Um, we need to do a lot better of coalescing and mobilizing the volunteers and those who are interested in supporting the commission because we definitely need your help. Uh, it's about continuing to advocate for resources and again, just a platform to tell this truth. We have to continue to do the hearing sessions that are our call based on the law that created us. And to think about the ways that we take the collective wisdom and learning and uh, knowledge that we've acquired and translated to action again going beyond just a report but what we tell the maryland general assembly how we mobilize the people how we utilize our museums our institutions we've got to make sure this story lives beyond the commission point blank period and does more than just be a part of history but also be a catalyst for change because if we haven't done that we've wasted our time mm. Um, big, big aspirations, um, important work for sure um, that everybody here is doing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what folks in the audience here, questions that you may have, and, and also folks who have been, been online. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. 
And uh, as you can tell, our panelists um, are, uh, are very articulate, very informed about the mission of the, of the important work that they're doing in Baltimore. I'm sure we'll be happy to answer anybody's question. Um, yes. Do, do we need a microphone? Yeah, there we go. And maybe you can just introduce yourself and where you're from. And Okay, I'm Jenny Williams. I'm from, from, or, okay, I'm here on uh, behalf, <laughs> on behalf of, of. Uh, Kim Vocology, along with um, my co-founder, Yola Dance, um, and I'm at UVA. Um, and my question is for uh, David. It sounds like there is a digital component of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission of um, sort of a data component of documenting the sites of racial terror lynchings. And I'm wondering how you all are navigating the difficult, difficult question of um, whether to, how to incorporate um, consent in representing these stories, particularly um, in light of, you know, a long tradition of, of intentional forgetting. Um, and I imagine there are many families who perhaps, given that that may be their ancestors' only representation on the internet, right, um, who may not, who may want that representation and others who may not. Jenny, can I ask you just to mention the work that you do with the... the well, don't give away my selfish reasons for asking. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, well, we, we work on um, a project about American slavery, and I built a database of the um, trafficking of enslaved people in the domestic, maritime domestic slave trade. Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it was a selfish question. Uh, it's all good. Um, so we certainly have relied on those who have done the work before us. So again, Maryland Lynching Memorial Project has been, uh, and certainly was a huge help with the approaches that we take. Um, we continue to build the digital aspect of, of what we do. So I, I will admit that for right now, we rely more on those historians and those archivists who have done that before us. Um, in terms of the history that we are looking to uncover and the extent to which we share that with the public, whether it's digital or otherwise. It, yeah, we borrow heavily and rely on the approval and consent of those descendants. Uh, again, above all else, it's we want to tell the truth. And while this is not in the name of the commission, it is about healing. So if the healing comes from making sure people know the story and again, elevate the humanity of that ancestor, cool, then we will, we will do that. Um, if there are certain components of the story that you just don't want anybody to know, as, as much as we are charged to know, we just have to respect those boundaries, right? We are not in a business, or our charge is not to re-traumatize, right. right? We hope that by telling the truth, there can be some form of healing because it's not just your story anymore. You don't have to hold on to the pain or the trauma anymore. Everybody's gonna know, or if it's up to us, everybody's gonna know your ancestor, but who they were as a person, not just the way in which they were killed. But that's your call, because it is your story and we're asking for permission uh, to share it as part of this larger uh, push for truth, right? Truth, healing, and justice. So, you know, that's, that's how we navigate it. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, and just to piggyback on top of that, so we are a foundation of descendants. Um, and it's very really interesting because I, I wanted to bring a point then ask you guys a question about how you deal with us is that even like this panel in this symposium today represents a roller coaster of our family story in terms of dealing with the trauma of it. We can start at slavery in Southwest Virginia where our ancestor was rented out to the railroads in that area as an enslaved man. And then once he's freed, he works with the railroad as a brakeman and his hand gets caught between coupling cars. He dies in 1897. His wife comes up to Baltimore with his youngest son. His youngest son ends up working for B&O. Um, when we talk to my grandmother, she has memories of, they used to come get black men from the front door and you would never see them again. And then she would phase out. So she, and she was essentially describing lynchings, but she couldn't talk anymore about it. First generation of my family to go to college was my mother and she went to Morgan. We moved to Remington, which is this area here. We was one of the first black families. Remington at that time was the little sister of Hamden, if you know the story of Hamden. So we were terrorized at all times. Exit outdoors, go back to Africa, Negro on the sidewalk, that's all through my childhood. My escape was Walters. 
I used to come over here as a little girl by myself, and I used to sit in the garden. I used to walk the gallery. There was a little lunch counter over there. They used to have me eat lunch, and then I would leave and come back to the terror of Little Hamden, which was Remington. Um, around 2008 or so, they decided that John Hopkins wanted to expand, and they wanted Remington, and this is what you see in Remington now. The police kicked our door, doors down, terrorized our family. It was an officer in the area that says, they really want this area and they want you out. So we're gone now. So as descendants, I'm just looking at this panel and I just see every step of your work touches our family. And when you're working with descendants, you're not just looking at how, how do we have a relationship with Walters? How do we have a relationship with BNO? How do we have a relationship with Morgan? How do we have a relationship with lynching? We have a relationship with all of you together. And so as we deal with this, as descendants deal with that, when you have a descendant who wants to talk to you, who wants to talk to you, who wants to talk to you, how have you found yourself dealing with the emotional tor turmoil of wanting to deal with the good and the bad of their histories? If you figured out anything at all, because that's one of the things that we are trying to navigate to figure out. I'll just quickly say that's the personal journey, right, for me. Um, I'll admit there has to be a little bit of a detachment, right? Because again, the stories that we're constantly encountering are of dehumanization. Uh, we're talking about economic deprivation. We're talking about a large system of terrorism, right? So your story, there's gonna be a lot of people that got that same story. And they, like you said, it's touched all of our institutions one way or another, right? It's touched our circumstances one way or another. And there is no perfect approach to how we share your story, if you so choose, or if any descendant so chooses, and the extent to which we, <sighs> wow. it's yeah, it's hard because it's, there's, there's never gonna be a perfect answer. And we, we don't want to objectify, or to, like you said, make a token, the story. Um, it, I, with a story like that, I would say it's up to you, the extent to which you want to work with us. Um, I can understand if you hated all our guts, right? Just because of what we read, and that's fine. I'm just saying hypothetically, like I, I can't blame anyone for having resentment, anger, whatever, to any of the institutions. I'm like, I'm from East Baltimore, so yeah, I know the Hawking story too. I grew up with them, right? And I work with them now. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of dissonance that I had to navigate. And I think it's about what purpose does the story serve now? So yes, it can be a story that focuses on the trauma, the killing, the dehumanization, but it can also be a story that focuses on the love, the unity, the, the relative peace, I would like to think. Um, the, res, you know, the resolve, the resilience, and I try not to use that word too much because we get so heavy on the word resilience, but yeah, resilience. Um, it's, it's about the orientation of the story. And I think with all our institutions, we're just trying to tell a fuller story, right? Like you can't ignore that it was some rich white people, Confederate sympathizers that created your, your gallery, which is now a museum. Can't take that back. But it's like, what's the story now, right? Same with the BNO Road, bunch of rich white dudes who took advantage of damn near everybody, I'm sure, to make their billions and billions who their families are still, you know, profiting off of now. That's the story, like, can't change that, but what is the story now? So again, that key word is relevance, right? So what can people learn from your story, right? What can people relate to from your story? If nothing else, to see how serious and how important it is to know that this exists. And it's not to poo poo or shame or any of that stuff, it's just to know the totality of the experience, right? We all have our individual perspectives on this world. The more that we know about it, the closer we get to the actual truth, right? And it is pluralistic, like you said, like, yeah, truths equal truth, right? You see what I'm saying? And the next step is, okay, what do we do with it, right? We learn stuff, we know stuff, we're exposed to the realities of the world, what do we do with it? That's a personal journey because you have to decide, can you live with things the way they are, even if they okay for you? And I deal with that too, even as a black man, because a black man, highly educated, got money, all this kind of stuff. There are days where I'm like, well, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. It ain't about me. 
that's what I got to keep reminding myself. And it ain't about me. And it would be a waste of my time and my life and my energy if I didn't use the privilege that I had in the platform that I had to help others. Because you know what? That's what people did for me. And that's the point. I, I would add, hearing voices like that, like, thank you for your story. I mean, we are deeply interconnected. Johns Hopkins was a major founder and made a lot of money from the BNL, which founded the school and the hospital and all that. Um, we, we had an experience where somebody said to us while making this exhibit, it, it, they needed to say it, it seems logical, but I wasn't thinking it, that this history is going to hit me as a black person differently than you coming into the museum. And so we had to incorporate that into the design process of providing a space for thinking and decompression um, as a part of the experience for those who would encounter the history differently than I would. And that was like a major component of facilitating that. So I think the more we hear these voices, these stories, and how it impacts you today, the better we as communicators can be to provide the right experience for everybody. Right. Okay. I think we may have time for two, right? Questions? So we'll take this question and one from online, and then we'll wrap up. Terrific. And just please introduce yourself, or, or maybe what organization you're connected with if you are sure, connected absolutely. to an organization. Hi, uh, my name is Marley. Um, uh, um, here, I guess, representing Hopkins, the graduate film and media program. Um, so my question is for David again. <laughs> I'm sorry, all the I guess all the questions are for David. You said something really beautiful about like um, how how does the at the end of the day, it's not about. Um, adults, it's really about how the stories are going to impact the next generation. And that's something that, you know, in the filmmaking process is something that we're, well, at least I'm constantly wrestling with is how do you translate stories to make sure that if you are telling something academic, how does it not just land in the world of academia, but expands outward and actually influences and changes and or expresses the voices and how younger people are interacting with media and stories, which is evolving constantly and every year is different. And every, you know, every year it becomes harder and harder to tell a story um, at, at, in, a, in a broader audience context. So I'm curious, especially with such, uh, w when you talk about interacting with younger people, what are some of the challenges and how do you kind of navigate that already complex relationship that younger people have with stories to kind of bring them into that or, you know, I'd love to know how you kind of interact with that kind of. <laughs> I'm interested as a magazine writer as well to your answer. All right, so I'm taking off the chair hat. I'm taking off the professor hat. I'm going to put on a storyteller hat. So let's, let's look at I'll say, picture in your minds a, a racial terror lynching. Yeah, I'm asking y'all to go there, okay? We can focus on the act, right, which showed up in a million different horrible ways. But think about what it fundamentally was, right? And I don't mean just the preservation of white power, which is what the system, you know, that perpetuated was looking for, but again, the minimalization, the degradation, the dehumanization of a person. Do we all have a moment in our lives where we thought someone was looking not at the totality of who we are and saw us as less than? Can we be honest with ourselves right now? How many can we can we show our hands? Like, let's be honest. Let's be brave and courageous. Okay, damn near all of us. Okay, I'm pretty sure young people can relate to that too. So even if they can't picture a racial terror lynching, right, and that image they can relate to the story of someone not seeing the whole them. Like I was a teenager once, ah, trust me. <laughs> that was pretty much my teenage years. No one saw me, they don't want the real me, they can't handle the real me, blah, 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 right? That's a very human story, all right? That's a human story. And then we can say, okay, that premise, that fundamental plot, let's show you all the ways that that showed up, sometimes to the extreme. Not only do we not see the whole you, we don't respect the whole you, we don't even respect the half you so much that we don't want you here, right? To the point that we will make an example out of you so that others that look like you or act like you or live where you live get the same message that we don't see you at all. People can relate to that. 
So I think really the onus is on museums and institutions of learning to find that common story, right? The story that we can all relate to and then use that as an opportunity to say, okay, there are examples in our history that reflect this story. Not only is it a part of history, but it actually explains a lot of our present too, because that's what kids and young people and, and teenagers are trying to do. They're trying to figure out what the hell is this? How did we get here? So the onus is on us to help guide them through that process of let's show you how we got here. And here's what we can do about it. I'm always going to emphasize that part because I don't want them to feel like, oh, this is what it is. We thought that 50 years ago, we thought that 100, it is what it is. No, it's not. Things will change. Things can change. But it takes initiative, right? It, it takes the courage. It takes knowing that you can't efficacy, right? You got to know that you can before you actually attempt to. So that's the part where we can galvanize and strengthen and crystallize, I think, the activism, however it looks, the advocacy, however it looks, the action, however it looks, that young people in particular should be taking in order to make this world what it should be for them, right? Because it'll benefit us too, even if that means putting us in our place. Can I add um, really quickly, yes, to all of that. And also, I would take it um, another step, which is pass the mic to the youth. Um, give the platform to the youth to tell their own stories the way they see it. And a couple of ways we've been doing that at the Walters is through this Community Voice Project where we have um, community members of all ages writing um, community labels alongside our curatorial labels. And we convened a college student advisory group this um, past academic year to do so, and we're continuing to do that work. We will be launching a photography program in the spring um, that will be giving teens cameras to tell their own stories. Um, and how does that, uh, how do they engage with the Walters as just the place that they're having this program, right? It's sort of like the business of the, the experience of them making and thinking and learning about telling their own stories, but they're gonna tell their own stories. They're not gonna tell necessarily stories about our art. They're not gonna tell stories about um, how their art connects to our art necessarily unless they're inspired by it, right? So how are we giving up space, um, time, resources for youth to do the work that they wanna share? Thank you, Teresa. And just, um, just to honor everybody's time and keep things on track here since we're the first panel, Real briefly, if we can get to quite one question from the web and, 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 and get a, a concise answer and, and we'll wrap, wrap up. <laughs> That's a tough uh, it's order. There are plenty, plenty of questions. Oh, uh, yeah, I wish we could get to responding. everything. Um, and a lot of really positive feedback, people thanking you for your panel and oh, great. Um, everything that's, that's been said. I guess the, the question that I'll sort of, I'll combine several questions in one and sort of um, orient us towards the future. And in particular, I think this is a question for the BNO and the Walters is, um, is there a thinking process by which these institutions can sort of unpack the economic um, inequalities that might still exist today as a result of the kind of um, wealth accumulation and capitalistic practices of your institutions? that you're thinking about right now in potentially a reparations kind of mode or anything um, in that order. There were several questions that were sort of about that. So thank, thank you. you. I guess I can kick it off. I mean, one, let's be clear, like the BNO made a lot of money, but we are a nonprofit occupying their old site. <laughs> um, so, you know, resources are limited for everybody. So I think it's, it really comes down to making conscientious choices as, as you were just saying about how we use our time, and that comes from the top, and where are we putting our resources. So it's, I think, bridging the gap for museums is, is, it's not just the history, but it's how we live in our communities. And so things like identifying what the, listening to the community, what the community needs, and responding in ways that we can, so for instance, with our workforce development program. That is not, that doesn't have, you know, it's mission driven in the sense that like we're a railroad and we can teach people that, but it's really also about being a good neighbor. And it's also, we just announced we're doing this big capital project and we're gonna be reorienting our space to really face West Baltimore and Southwest Baltimore and become a part of this sort of development that's happening around Pigtown and all that and sort of becoming 
integrated with the community. So I think it's really about that. It's, a, it's about where we put our focus and how we spend our days. Teresa, it looks like you've been pondering this it's such, a good, it's such a complex and great question. Um, I, I have a few thoughts. One is that, first of all, accessibility is a pillar of our institution, and we have been free since 2016. Is that right? 20? 2014. 2014. So, so since 2014, we've been free. So, I mean, just in terms of being a good neighbor, being somebody that creates a space for people to come and have some respite um, for free is a huge um, thing that we've been doing for a while. A few other things is that we also provide bus funding for schools to come to the museum for their Title I schools, so we help in that way. We are also, um, a couple things for the future, is that we are relaunching an internship program. We did have and have had and continue to have different experiences for emerging professionals, but in all honesty, it wasn't equitably, um, uh, it wasn't an equitable experience. So some were paid, some were volunteer. We decided in 2019 we would not have any unpaid internships and we are relaunching a paid internship program um, this summer. So we will be able to have an opportunity for people not just in curatorial or conservation or the sort of the, the sexier fields that people are aware of, but in other departments to gain skills that are not necessarily just for museums. So for example, how can you learn about design in a museum space? Or how can you learn about um, finance in a museum space? And those skills can be transferable elsewhere. Um, one final thing that I'm really excited about exploring is how can we um, think about our services in a different way? Um, how are we making space for local business owners like Couples Tea? Um, to have a space in our store and sell their products, which we are doing, and they have a special uh, tea that is just available at the Walters. So um, really making a difference in that particular way with local businesses as well. Thanks, Teresa. I think a lot of what you've articulated would be really transferable to a lot of organizations you know, in, in Baltimore um, and, and can inspire a lot of organizations. I wanna wrap up and I wanna thank Dr. Jones for uh, inviting me to moderate, but also for bringing the panel together and um, I want to thank David and Jonathan and Anna and Teresa. Uh, it was really a wonderful discussion, and this will be uh, eventually uploaded to YouTube, I believe. Yeah, where um, I'll just say I personally have watched like every hard history webinar, usually on the treadmill with my earplugs in. Like that's how I knew Jenny Williams' work and everything. Um, so I just want to give a little round of applause to our, our wonderful panel today. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>